Christine, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here, Teresa. I um, I know that you have uh, you do a lot of work with neuroscience and leadership, and a wide variety of topics actually. And so I enjoyed kind of perusing your YouTube videos and your uh, <laughs> website and the, the upcoming retreat and all kinds of things. So I, I've got a few questions. Um, but the big one that I'd like to talk about today, or the main one, is why mindfulness and meditation matter in leadership. Oh, huge. Great question. Here's the thing. Um, leaders set the tone. And what's really cool is if you look at Lionel Tiger's research from Rutgers, what he shows or what he learned was that, first of all, we know that human beings have only 4% difference in DNA than primates. So we're really close to monkeys. <laughs> and what he found was that primates look to their leader every 20 to 30 seconds, and they decide how they should feel and behave based on their leader. So we look at the emotional tone. So if our leader is really irritated, if our leader seems kind of scared, if our leader feels like they don't maybe have it all together, we then feel that way as well. So it's so key for leaders to manage their emotional state. And in our executive coaching, we use a bunch of different tools to do this. But what I'm finding is really helpful right now is for people to help their team focus on outcomes that they want instead of the problems that keep cropping up. And um, one of the tools that we use for that is called the outcome frame. So whenever people are spinning about like all the stuff that's not working, oh my gosh, there's all these problems. It's just a series of questions and here they are. And we'll have an infographic for the show page. What would we like? Or if it's for an individual, hey, what would you like? And it's something you can create and maintain, not to win the lottery, for George to not be so hard to work with. No, it's something you can create and maintain. So, so what would you like, or what would we like if we're doing it in a group? What will having that do for us? Or what will having that do for me? What will the benefits be? How will I feel? Benefits and how you will feel. Because you know what? We don't usually want outcomes. We want to feel differently. So once we get present to how we want to feel, that's usually what the outcome is. Um, how will we know when we have it is the third question. How will we know when we have this outcome that we want so badly? What proof, tangible proof will show up? And then uh, my favorite one, the ego question, what that we value might we risk or lose? What are you going to have to let go of? What's the cost? And then I'll give you an example in a second. And then um, what are your next steps? So for instance, what would you like to be peaceful inside regardless of what's happening outside? What will happen that do for you? Well, I'll feel empowered. I'll be a better leader. I'll be able to manage my emotional state. I'll be able to help my team navigate hurdles. I'll feel peaceful, powerful, joyful. That's a pretty good package. <laughs> How will you know when you have it? When I get uh, two hours of quiet time every Friday to plan out the week, when I stop and catch myself and call out the emotion that I'm experiencing instead of taking out on others, when my team is meeting their deadlines and the stress level in the office is palpably lower. Okay, uh, what a value might I risk or lose? Well, when I start to get really irritated, I'm gonna have to pause. So I'm gonna let go of irritation. I'm gonna let go of victim mentality. I'm gonna have to let go of wanting people to be other than they are. Okay, what are your next steps? Meet with the team, talk about this new version of me that I want, lay out how we're going to navigate hurdles. Example. Great, perfect. I think right now, especially, but leaders are under so much pressure and and the challenges right now are, this is the first time in my lifetime I've seen where it's really hard to predict what's coming. You know what I mean? Because, <laughs> which is sort of important in leadership. <laughs> so I really think too, or I don't know if you agree with this, but by practicing mindfulness from the sheer perspective of uh, being able to focus and not get the angst and the panic because b between inflation and the political stuff and the pandemic and the monkeypox and the great resignation and you know there's so much going on so i do see that benefit for me with practicing mindfulness is i can feel it starting to spiral like it's too much and then i can bring myself back in yeah i think that witness right the witness yes. and you know we know the harvard research right when we when we practice mindfulness for just 20 minutes a day. And it can be four or five minute chunks, two 10 minute chunks. 
what happens is the cell density in our prefrontal cortex increases, but our problem solving, solving better clarity, better, I'm here, but I want to be there. The cell density in our amygdala decreases less irritation, frustration, fight, flight, freeze. The cell density in our hippocampus increases um, learning, memory. And when we start to notice the physiological benefits uh, of mindfulness meditation, it's, it's huge. And it's a privilege to be a leader. You know, it's really a privilege. And it's like being a professional athlete of sorts, right? You have to do the work to stay at the top of your game. And with leadership, a lot of it is the inner work. Yeah, definitely. I, I always refer to it as it is an exercise for your brain. Every day that you meditate is exercise. <laughs> um, so, so we're talking about leaders and leadership, but what is your definition of leadership? Yeah, my definition of leadership is, is a person who cultivates and elevates others intentionally, cultivates and elevates others, and is continuously looking, kind of gauging uh, the tribe, if you will, and figuring out what we need to do to enroll, align, engage, because we're only as good as our team is. You, when you think of like you and I right now, um, yeah, sure, we're we're doing this podcast, but we're counting on somebody else for electricity, <laughs> you know, and Wi-Fi and computers, right? We do so little ourselves. It's very humbling when you drop into it. Yeah, we need others. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I always think it's important to point out because a lot of people think leadership is is a role, a title. So you have to be a manager or a director or a president to be oh, a leader. Yeah. And there's so much power and in, in leadership in parents and teachers in the janitor can be a leader, right? It, it's not about your job title. It's about what you just said. I love that definition. Yeah. You know, I think everyone is a leader because when you look at, sure, you know, the janitor, the gardener, whatever, um, it, it's how we show up for others because we're leading our families, we're leading our friends, we're leading in our nonprofit endeavors. And most importantly, as you and I both know, we're leading ourselves. Yes. You know, we're making those tough choices um, when our ego wants to, rawr, you know, we're making those choices to say, no. <laughs> I want to, I'm witnessing that. So that's actually not me. You know, I am the part that witnesses all this stuff happening inside of me. Okay. So let's drop into that. Yeah. I, um, I frequently teach that the first step to successful leadership is self leadership, because if we don't start with ourselves, how are we setting the example or motivating others or inspiring others, right? We, we have to be the models, regardless, again, of your job title. So I think, I'm, I thank you for going into that a little bit, because I do think some people get confused and think, oh, I'm not a CEO, so it doesn't apply to me. <laughs> it applies to all of us, right? And I think there's three parts of it, right? It's lead self, lead others, lead the business. Yeah. But we're all leading self. Yeah. yeah. Thank Definitely. you for pointing that out. Yeah. Um, another thing that is rampant these days is distractions, right? So with everything going on, that in itself is a distraction. And then in organizations, so many individuals are having different challenges, personal and professional. And then yeah. you've just got the the 24 seven sort of cycle, right? And yeah. so with all of those distractions, I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about what you call quieting external noise to step into self power. Yeah. Okay, so a friend of mine was just saying this to me on a hike yesterday. He was saying, have you noticed that in the beginning of COVID, everyone was like, hey, we're in this together. There was all this love and shared experience. And now a lot of people are like, hey, I'm freaking over it. Yeah. I don't want to do this. I don't want, I'm over it. It's like, yeah, and you're part of a collective. <laughs> um, so one tool that is really helpful because we have to clear the decks, if you will, before we can actually let ourselves get still. So let's look at, at two tools. The first one, um, maneuvers of consciousness. This takes a whopping 12 minutes <laughs> and it changes your state entirely. And we'll put uh, an infographic on the show page. So you grab your phone, you set the timer for three minutes. The first phase is negative evaluation. Okay, so you're just gonna like, 
you, it's best if you can have a buddy just witnessing, but you're just going to say all the stuff that you're irritated with, everything that you're resisting, rah, 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 this isn't fair, this is rah, 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 rah. You do it for three minutes. Then you look at the emotion wheel. We'll also put that on the uh, show page and you look how you're feeling. I'm feeling victimized. I'm feeling angry, resentful. Then you shake your body out. Okay, you're done. You, you keep, let it all out. Now, three minutes on curiosity. Here comes the mindfulness. Huh, I wonder if this would be so irritating for me three years from now. I wonder if this would be so irritating if I looked at it in a different way. I wonder if this would be so irritating if I thought of how my mom might look at it, you know, and you start to get really curious about this thing that's got you tied up in knots. Three minutes, look at the emotional wheel. Wow, now I'm feeling sort of pensive. I'm feeling sort of thoughtful. Might still be feeling a little angry and frustrated, but still there's a shift. Shake your body out three more minutes. Now, amazement. Wow, it's amazing that with all this awareness, I got so irritated about this. It's amazing that this problem even occurred with such smart people that we are it's you know so you, you're amazed then you look at the emotional meal now you're moving more towards peaceful powerful joyful shake your body out three more minutes full appreciation wow how great that this situation is occurring because it's really helping me step into a bigger version of myself it's really helping me see how great my life actually really is it's really helping me see how beautiful humanity is whatever it took you 12 minutes you know that's excellent. And and we call it maneuvers of consciousness because I want us all to remember you can maneuver your consciousness. You're not like a victim of it. Then after we do that, so we've cleared the deck, then we can do an outcome frame if we want. Okay, so now what would I like? What will have that do for me, et cetera? Or we can just do seven, seven, seven breathing. Inhale through the nose, tongue on the right behind the front teeth, mouth closed. Inhale for the count of seven, hold for the count of seven. Exhale for the count of seven, hold the exhale for a count of seven. And we do seven of the seven, seven, seven breathing and we've reset our state. So maybe what, 15 minutes total instead of suffering for hours or days. That's fantastic. And uh, I kind of like that balance because a lot of exercises and including, I, I certainly share quick, like little quick hits for people trying to re-regulate, but they're so short. You know, I always try to say that's like first aid. You're not really, you're not getting very deep, but it'll get you through. But 12 minutes is not that much time or 15 minutes out of your entire day. But that's enough in those three phases to feel like you might be able to really feel the shift. So wonderful. And it's cool because you start to go, oh, you know what? I'm actually resilient. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I have choice. <laughs> um, another thing that I read it was a, an article you did in Forbes a couple of months ago. And I thought this was really interesting and wondered if you could share with our listeners what stress laxation is. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I bet you guys have experienced this. So stress laxation is basically you're super stressed and you try to relax and it almost makes it worse. And the stress doesn't go away. And you find that you actually don't know how to relax. So um, emotions have energy. And um, Dr. David Hawkins, um, MD, PhD, did, wrote the book Power Versus Force, for those of you who are familiar with it. And he actually measured the magnetic field. He called it the log level of different emotions. And we need to get those out of our magnetic field. And I find that stress laxation is really occurs when people haven't cleared the decks, like we just described with, you know, maneuvers of consciousness. This is why, frankly, Teresa, I don't think we have a choice. I think we all have to exercise every day. I mean, yeah, of course it's healthy, but I think we have to in today's day and age because it's the most effective way to clear emotions. And if, if for those of you who want the physiological, if it's like, this was too cosmic, Christine, here's the physiological part of it. When we are in fight, flight, freeze, when we are in these stress states, mad, sad, scared, and all the variations of them, our brain is flooded with norepinephrine. So it's like adrenaline, uh, but it's in our brain instead of our body. The only way to get rid of norepinephrine is time or cardio. We have no enzymes in our physiology to break it down, which is how we're here. Thank goodness we don't have those enzymes because our ancestors could run away from the saber-toothed tiger right, with all that um, adrenaline and norepinephrine, 
and they survived. However, we haven't had an upgrade. So we actually have to have a vigorous walk, you know, to clear that stuff. Otherwise you just suffer and wait for about two hours. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I actually tell people that they're sitting in a puddle of stress when they get all upset in like on the freeway. Well, here in LA, you know, I don't know why they call them freeways, but the point is <laughs> you, you get <laughs> that you get that rush of those hormones and you're just sitting there. So they have nowhere to go. So no. I totally agree with you. You've got to move. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you got to move. And if you can't just do some seven, seven, seven breathing or do the maneuvers of consciousness out loud, you know, three minutes each time, just do your best. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. And I think too, you know, we're talking about the importance of mindfulness, of, of course, and that's part of mindfulness is recognizing what's happening. Right. So when you, you know, I know, right. I know before the big flood even happens because I realize I'm starting to clench my teeth. Right. Yeah. So I've got this little thing starting and I stop right then. It's like, okay, no, 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 no. <laughs> Take a breath, walk around the block, you know, whatever it is I need to do, because I don't want to feel like that. And I don't think anybody does, but for some people, and I'm noticing this again, um, it is interesting. And you, you, you touched on it a few minutes ago, but something is happening is what I feel like with a lot of people. And I don't know if it's pent up anxiety or, but they're, but people are behaving in ways that aren't good for them. I mean, it's certainly not benefiting them, but it's not benefiting others either. And I am also seeing people are not, and, and this includes people in leadership roles at work. Um, they're not taking vacations. They're, uh, I don't, it's like a, you can feel that energy. It's like this very almost, I don't want to say hostile is too strong, but it's definitely some kind of anxiety in, in mass. <laughs> you know, I've, I've noticed a couple of things. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, there's a lot going on right there. Um, okay. So a few things, there is this weird, well, we've all been apart for a couple of years, so we have to all get together. We have to have a million meetings. We've got to fly all over the country, you know, so yeah, there's that like, urgency anxiety around trying to make up for the two years we just had and if you remember the remember the two years the good part right how we got like back connected to nature and all that wonderful stuff but separately i don't want us to discount the uh the grieving um because we all experienced a shared trauma that was extended over a long period of time uh, we're not entirely out of it. And, you know, look, this is the new normal, right? COVID is the new normal. What's the next variation going to be, right? right? And we had the separativity of the, the vaxxers, the anti-vaxxers. We've seen political turmoil around it, whatever. There's all sorts of stuff. And I want us to notice that you can't grieve when you're in survival mode. We've been in, sur we've been in survival mode. And just now, the grief is coming up. But what happens when grief comes up? It's a feeling of lack of control, right? Crying, upset. So where, what do we reach for instead? Often on the behavioral menu, anger. Anger, yeah. Because anger is better than sorrow, right? Because it feels some sense of control. But, um, but it just causes us to suppress the grief further. And it comes out, as you just said, in all sorts of inappropriate ways. So I really recommend that people just like feel and grieve what occurred, do whatever little ceremony you want. I was asking this high powered executive. He's like, well, I don't know how to do that. I said, okay, here are three movies. Watch one of these movies. Let yourself cry. Let yourself identify with the protagonist and just let that, you can use a movie to do that. That's okay. You know, just got to get it out of your body. Yeah. Well, no, that's, that's a really interesting perspective because it, it it's almost baffling to me because it feels like this is a time for celebration and, 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 and we, I thought we learned a whole lot of important lessons during that traumatic period Yeah, and that things would change in a different way <laughs> once everybody was out. So, and of course I'm talking broadly, I'm not talking about every person, but it's just been very fascinating to me to watch what's happening on teams, what's happening yeah. in companies. Um, it, absolutely amazing. Yeah. So thank you for that. Yes. Um, so how, so when, so when someone is, maybe you could give a tip, um, when someone is, oh, and, and again, let's take work because that's where most people spend most of their time. But if a, a leader's at work and they've got this sort of um, 
whatever you want to call it, discombobulation happening on their teams. And it's and it seems to be all for different reasons. And this is the part I find fascinating because I don't think it's really for different reasons. And you just summed it up greatly with, you know, if it's the release of grief, we can deal with that, right? We can process it. But as a leader trying to lead a team, what what best, what's like a tip or best advice you would give them as to how to get started with getting the team back into cohesiveness and a, like a calmer state? Thank you. Okay. So um, we use a tool that we call the feedback frame. It's only two questions, just like the outcome frame. You can use it in a group as well. And I'm going to write down to make sure that I send you the infographic. The feedback frame, super easy. Many of us were taught the feedback sandwich. You're awesome, but you're not so awesome here, but you're awesome because I feel really uncomfortable giving you feedback. Okay. And the brain's like, oh, am I awesome? Am I not? Oh, I'm confused. What works much better is to say what's working is bing, bing. And what I'd like to see more of is bong, bong. Okay, what's working is we load up and we have the visual auditory kinesthetic experience of the things that are working. Okay, yeah, got it. She likes those things. Those are working. Check. And what I'd like to see more of is, and then the brain pattern matches. Oh, so she likes this. She wants more of that. Okay, so I could use some of these skills to that. Okay, we don't say what's not working. Bad idea. Sends people into career state, fight, flight, freeze. So what we can do is with the team is we can say, hey, everybody, so let's look at this project, the workplace, whatever. What's working here? And everyone starts to holler out what's working. You know, we can jot it down. And what would we like to see more of? Well, I think our team meetings, um, I'd like to see uh, actually fewer team meetings, more efficient, you know? So what would we like to see more of? Efficiency in our meetings, you know, et cetera. And together, it's, we need to bring people together. That's like the key word right now. So how can we bring people together? So when we do a what's working, what would we like to see more of? And, and we can also use the outcome frame as, as a tool. Um, but I want to add something in that we lead from, from where we are. And so much of it is unconscious. And I want to take a sec, and this is deep stuff, so stay with me, everybody, because you'll be stoked afterwards. Um, I want us to understand the decisions that we make between six months and three years old with our little baby brain where our prefrontal cortex is nowhere near being cooked. It won't be cooked until we're 21 as a woman and 25 as a man. And yet, because humans are so amazing, between six months and three years old, we look around and we decide what rights we have, okay? The five rights that we decide are right to exist. Is it okay that I'm here? Is it okay that I have a voice? Is it okay that I take up space? Right to have needs. What are my needs? Is it okay that I have those needs? If I ask for someone to fulfill my needs and they don't, is it okay that I ask somebody else? It, can I get my needs met? Um, right to take action. Um, can I go after what I want? Can I be accountable? Can I be dependable? Can I follow through? Can I make it happen? right to have consequences. Oh, I took action and it didn't work out. Is it okay for me to say, I messed up, here's how I'm gonna fix it, et cetera, or do I need to blame and shame others or make excuses? And then last, the right to love. It's a combo pack, Teresa, love and be loved. Because a lot of us are like, oh, I'm really good at loving. Yeah, but how about asking for support, letting the love in? So I find that if you just take a moment and you drop in and I will send you an org rights because I've never learned really to check this out infographic and just say, okay, for so like zero to five, how would I rate my right to exist? And what I find very often, Teresa, is low rights to exist and low right to have needs for leaders, very high rights to, your, you know the answer, take action and have consequences. So could it be that since we're so reliable and so action-oriented that we're actually paying to exist. And when we drop into that, many people will say, yeah, wow, in my family, if I didn't get good grades, I was persona non grata. You know, if I wasn't mom's little helper, you know, then I wasn't valued. And our org rights really determine how we show up. They determine how we lead. And once we're aware of them, 
then we can start to say, okay, I want to take up more space. I want to be more present with myself. I want to be more present with others. Presence is all about right to exist. I want to actually find out what my needs are because when I'm triggered, the answer is not feeling seen. When you're triggered, not having your needs met, you know, feeling like you can't take action. And I want people to start to drop into that because it's really profound and it's really liberating. Definitely. And, and I think it's, it's so interesting because I was just on a coaching call and, and part of the goal person had, had to do with being less reactive. And I think that ties into what you're talking about, because if we're, if we, if, if we're not dealing with the first two that you just talked about, we're pretty much only able to react, right? Instead of thinking yeah. through and being proactive or responsive. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. We aren't responding from choice. We're compulsively yeah. reacting. And when there's a compulsive reaction, it is historical. It is about a decision that was made a long time ago. Yeah. Very interesting. Well, I know you have a uh, retreat, a Beyond Your Brain retreat coming up. Yes. So, so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yes. Beyondyourbrain.com. Or if it's easier, you can just go to christine.com. Traditional spelling. C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E dot com and we have links there but beyond your brain is really about individuals that want to step away from their life for just a few days three days and really look at their experience look at how they experience themselves connect deeply with nature connect with the elements we bring in a lot of um, native american and peruvian shamanism so we're connected to the earth, water, wind, sky, sun, moon, kind of return to how we were hundreds of years ago when we actually were connected and had relationship with the natural world. And many of us are trying to get back in relationship with the natural world and remember that we're part of this beautiful collaboration. We're all in this together, humans, nature, et cetera. We're all doing this together, living on this gorgeous and mysterious planet. So understanding energy, we work on that. Understanding who you truly are and what you are capable of. And we have this one uh, process where people move things with their, move physical objects with their mind. And once you've moved a physical object with your mind, you understand energy in a whole different way. And you actually understand yourself in a whole different way. And you start to realize, wow, I actually have a greater impact than I thought I did. I actually affect others energetically more than I thought I did. Oh, wow. I feel how thoughts actually have energy that you can, that you can touch almost, right? And as we start to take more responsibility for ourselves, we actually care for ourselves more deeply, care for others more deeply feel more connected to all that is more deeply and whatever a person it's it's spiritual it's not religious whatever a person's experience of god is god goddess great spirit whatever term you like yahweh uh it deepens and there's this feeling of safety and belonging and mattering that's very quiet and profound and still that uh, sounds lovely it is. <laughs> I think everyone needs to just take a retreat. <laughs> I just think that would be a good idea. I think we all need a retreat at least every year. I like to have short retreats every quarter. Yeah. Yeah. I um, Obviously, some of my habits fell off the board over the last couple of years. But I do think it's important to say that, especially in our technology-driven times, yeah. Um, you you really don't get a break. Like if you're if you're just at home or even on a vacation, like you know you think you're taking a break. Most people aren't really taking a break. They're checking their devices. They're checking in on the office. They're checking on the house, whatever it is. But when you actually go to a retreat, it is an opportunity to shut out everything else. And I I I always found that I was amazed at how disconnected I was because I didn't think I was you know, but when I got there and then when I really disconnected from outside, it was like, oh, now I can reconnect again. So it, there's a very, um, I think, uh, substantial value in the idea of just even the idea of a retreat. Like, I don't know if people really understand you know, 
necessarily what that means. If they think it just means it's like they go to a hotel somewhere, it's really not. It's where mentally and physically you are entering like a little different world for a while. Yes. And it does give you that chance to go inward and and reconnect with yourself in addition to the people that you're with. But I think they're yeah. very valuable. It's like going into the chrysalis, you yeah. know? Yeah, you're absolutely. You're the caterpillar, you're going into the chrysalis and you come out three days later and it's it's a new butterfly version of you. <laughs> yeah, um, it's really yeah. fantastic. That's why we have to, you know, our ours are in beautiful places in nature. Like this one's in Monterey in the Silomar. Yeah, so people can walk on the beach in between, you know, at meals and stuff. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Well, if you had, I guess we'll close this with a, if you had one piece of advice for leadership today, uh, mm -hmm. today, today, like leaders today and, and right now and what we're dealing with, uh, wh where would you suggest they start? Yeah. Um, I would say, uh, Oh, I'll hold up a little stone. I would say, choose you. I would say, get still, get curious about who you truly are. Because you are having a greater impact than you realize. And we need you now more than ever. So do the work to remember who you are and to step into that. And to course correct as you need, gently <clears throat> and with compassion with yourself so that you can show up more powerfully for yourself and others. Because there's a lot of healing that we need to do. True and so important. And I totally agree. I, I, I think it's it can't be understated that mm -hmm. if we're okay, we're so much better able to support other people. But when we're not okay, then, then we can't really contribute all of our skills and talents and, you know, wonderful attributes into the world. So thank you for that. Yes, thank you. I will uh, put the information in the outro of this podcast. And uh, if people want to find out more about your work, do they go to the same website? It's probably the easiest just to go to christine.com. Okay. Because from there you can get to Smart Tribes Institute and the Beyond Your Brain Retreat. Yeah, just go to christine.com. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Teresa.